Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to Found Flix. On this explained vid, we're looking at the recent hit Netflix series, Archive 81. Following an archivist who takes a job restoring damaged videotapes, but finds himself getting pulled into a mystery involving a young woman's disappearance and a strange cult that may be trying to destroy the world. I ended up really enjoying this series. It does a good job of balancing character along with the developing mystery, but really it was how the story unfolded that really drew me in. Each episode adds more and more layers to the increasingly complicated story and takes us into many unexpected directions. It's honestly a pretty huge change from where things start to where they end up. It was kind of crazy to think about when the finale ended. There is a ton of plot and various mysteries to look into that pop up over the course of the season and you know that's what I'm all about. We're going to leave no stone or mystery unturned, really digging into every aspect of the show, which is also why this video is like an hour long. There's just a a lot to cover. While it is a fairly complex story, it actually feels simple in the end and wraps up a lot of the bigger mysteries. That is, except when it comes to the ending itself, that I really feel like blows open the whole show's world into an exciting new direction and leaves us with a ton of questions, and there is a bunch of stuff to look at with just the ending itself. Well, there's no time to waste, so let's get to the tapes in Archive 81, breaking down the story and its many mysteries, just what the cult is all about and what they desire as well as explaining the ending and theorizing where things could go in season two. It's a lot! Maybe grab a snack or something. Things begin, simply enough, with a static-filled message from a young woman, Melody, who turns to the camera asking for help. And the search for her becomes the backbone of our story as it develops. In The Big Apple, we meet Dan, who has a peculiar interest in strange old tapes, seemingly trying to find things forgotten or lost, which he brings back to life via restoration. The street vendor mentions that someone called Jill stopped by recently, and at the mention of the name, Dan looks shaken up, the guy asking if they're still on friendly terms. Doesn't sound like it, and Jill must be an ex of Dan's that had a big impact on him. He works at the Museum of Moving Images and looks to be quite skilled at his craft. A new collection comes in from a woman called Evie Crest, and the footage is in dire need of help. Its contents are a lost movie called The Circle, starring an actor William Crest, Evie's dad, which features a kind of strange cult ritual. Dan and explaining it's a horror anthology, a pre-Twilight Zone kind of thing. It was Evie that discovered a box of old tapes buried at his estate, both agreeing it is some pretty creepy shit. The lady suggests that this could get him some real glory, but Dan is only interested in giving Evie a piece of her father back, very important to his character and what he's all about. This speaks to the power that film and video can have. It lives long past ourselves. His boss gives him a new mysterious project, the tape appearing smashed and burnt. He builds the cassette and watches the footage, seeing Melody, the girl from the opening, who is doing a dissertation on the Visser apartment building. She jokes with her friend Annabelle, saying that she's worried she'll find a new best friend, but Mel promises that she won't, and the tape cuts. Dan is already curious and does a Googler onto the apartments, learning about a fire back in 1994 that killed at least 11. Yet strangely, no bodies were ever found. Hmm. Dan's buddy Mark runs a podcast, and while Mark is a firm believer in the supernatural, telling the story of a cursed wedding ring, Dan doesn't believe in any of that kind of shit. Just about to leave, Mark gets real with him, telling him to let him know if he needs help, to which Dan limply agrees. So there is some kind of issues that Dan has gone through recently, which his friend is worried about bubbling back up to the surface. His boss is impressed with his work on the crispy tape, and he's invited to meet the man who sent it, who works at the mysterious LMG company, housed in a looming large building. There he meets Virgil, who has an offer for him. Dan first is confused just what this place does. He couldn't find any info on them whatsoever. And Virgil points out that it was the same for Dan, both agreeing that they like their privacy. Virgil lays out the job offer to him. The tape that he restored was recovered from the fire at the Visser, and there are several other tapes that he wants him to restore. It sounds enticing enough with a fee of 100K, although due to the tape's fragile state, the work must be done at a remote facility in the Catskills. Hmm, suspicions are only getting started. Dan appears is about to turn him down, and Virgil proves that he knows more than he's letting on, bringing up that he would have a special understanding of the situation, as he lost his family in a fire, and since then, he's been spending his life trying to bring things back to people. He's incensed that Virgil somehow knew about his private history, and we flash briefly to him as a kid walking his pooch and humming a creepy melody. His sister is there, plucking at the piano, and young Dan stares wide-eyed, coming to his house engulfed in flames. Well, this must be the past incident, Virgil 
Michael was referring to. Dan awakes from the nightmare and is compelled to return to Mel's footage, and there, something catches his eye. It looks like amongst the pics on her mirror, one includes her and his childhood dog, Cleo. But how in the world can that be? He shows off the strange connection to Mark, who isn't so sure, considering he's just seeing things that he wants to, and believes that this is somehow all tied back to Jill. He's adamant this is not about her, and besides, he's the one that runs a podcast talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. How is something like this out of the realm of possibility? Mark also was unable to dig up anything on the company, saying they could be into some sinister stuff. But Dan is confident this is a sign. Besides, if he is seeing what he wants to, maybe it's time for him to take a closer look. He rides through the forest with Virgil, who keeps bringing up more personal info about Dan, smirking it off as merely a background check, but still proves this guy isn't showing all of his cards already. Get used to that, Dan. The facility is a bit dated, but quite stately. And at least the technology is top of the line. Oddly, there's no internet, and the cell signal is spotty, but they do have a trusty old landline. Right, top of the line technology, but no internet. And you're in the middle of nowhere, not suspicious at all. Virgil takes him down to where the tapes are housed, along with the camera used to shoot them all, and the gig seems straightforward enough. On the way out, Virgil hands him an emergency signal wristband, making sure to mention that includes not just medical, but mental professionals, just in case he needs it, you know? He too seems aware of Dan's breakdown, despite how he initially presented things. Virgil is confident, that's all in the past. He has a clean bill of health, but regardless, they're available if he needs them. It's almost like he's expecting him or hoping that he's going to lose his shit again for some reason. He gets right to work on the first tape, but is distracted by another door guarded by a lock. He tries to get in, but is refused access. Dan, scoffing curiosity, killed the cat. The next tape shows Mel on day one of her project on the Visser. According to archives she found, it was built back in the 1930s, but doesn't really stand out amongst the other buildings in the city. Though there is some strangeness to its history, having been built over a mansion that burned down in the 20s and features some strange symbols carved into the outside facade. The maintenance guy, John, takes her through the building and to her new digs. Mel asks him about a Julia Bennett. Did she ever live here? But John is cagey, refusing to answer for what he says are privacy reasons. Also strange, when she asks for advice about meeting new people, he only suggests for her to stay away from the sixth floor. She's awoken later to the sound of faint chanting, pinpointing that it is coming through the vents. She shouts out hello to the opening, and the silence is overtaken by loud static, Mel trying to get herself together. The next day, she knocks on doors in hopes of interviewing the tenants, but no one even bothers to answer. She's given a break, though, when seeing a kid Jess there, who does delivery for the tenants, and she's at least a little more open than the others, agreeing to help her get subjects in exchange for a little bit of cash. Her first interviewee is Tamara, a musician working on an opera. She plays her a clip from her latest work called Purgatory, hearing a woman's voice vocalizing along with odd chanting. Mel is confused, thinking that this is exactly what she heard last night in the vents. But before she can answer, a phone call pulls Tamara away. As the song continues, it has a noticeable physical effect on Mel. She gets to her feet, only to collapse, asking Jess if the music also makes her feel strange. Dan finds himself humming the strange tune and calls Mark to get him to look into Tamara and the song. He wanders around downstairs, trying all the other doors, and finds that every single one of them are locked. Virgil calls in to check on him while he's fiddling with a box with another film in it that must be important to Dan. Scouring through the bookshelves, he finds a notebook that looks like a daily log of some kind, but stuffs it back in without much thought. He is flooded with more flashes of memories, his sister playing the same weird song from Tamara's, and he wakes up. Having caught a rat, he can't bring himself to get rid of it, and rather decides to befriend it, naming it Ratty. Well, very clever. He fixes another tape, featuring Jess's interview with Mel, revealing that she was born in the building, right out in the stairwell, leaving her wondering if it is perhaps bad luck to be born in this place. Mel doesn't think so, and is more curious about what led people to the building in the first place, just considering that perhaps something pulled them here, asking if Sam told her about the building. But Mel doesn't know who that is just yet. Jess suddenly looks out of sorts, backing up in her chair with a blank gaze. Her breath quickens, and she's lifted to her feet, appearing to be choked, and tumbles to the floor convulsing. The tape slows and gets distorted, the image changing to a white outline of a figure amongst the static. And the creature starts to try to step beyond the screen. It appears right in front of Dan, freaking him out and fleeing from the room. He gets through to Mark, who was unable to track down anything on Tamara, but he's already got more for him to look into, namely the LMG company, as well as Melody. Looking around the trees, he sees someone nearby with a red hood, but when turning back, they vanished. He has another memory flash of his sister playing the song, saying she heard it on a tape, and their dad comes in growling to stop playing 
playing it, telling Dan it's time to take Cleo out for a walk. This fateful walk is what prevented him from burning to death like the rest of his family, which is, you know, pretty tragic. You can see how much it still affects him now. Finding the tape has somehow gotten unspooled, he reconstructs it and picks up right where he left off, with Jess now looking more calmed down. According to the doctors, they always say that nothing is wrong, it's just in her imagination. But Mel knows what she saw. She says that her mom takes her to Father Russo for so-called spiritual guidance. She changes the subject to church. Mel used to go, but not anymore, and then asks if she believes if there's a world other than this one. Not heaven or hell, a world like this one, but different. More than this world. She starts talking about an even stranger concept, if she's strong enough to hold a new world inside of her. Mel encouraging, sure, you can do anything you want to. to hold a whole world inside of you, sure. Jess smiles and takes her hand, telling her that she's happy she's here. The tape suddenly cuts to Mel crying that they took Jess, and she runs into John, reminding her the sixth floor is off limits, sending her back downstairs where she runs into Samuel, who she hasn't technically met yet. She then encounters two other guys in uniforms, and we're back at the opening message, pleading for someone to find her and to help. The guys grab her, and shockingly, Dan's dad enters, trying to calm her down. His mind blown, he keeps mumbling that he doesn't understand what's happening, and we pull out seeing the entire facility is covered in cameras from every angle, all overseen by Virgil, of course. Static crackles, and we see a commercial for a DNA testing company called Wellspring, all about how they can help you find your community connection as well as ourselves, which we soon find out has a connection to the mysterious LMG. Dan phones Mark with the news of seeing his dad back in 94 at the Visser, and he accuses Virgil of being a liar. He must have known his dad was on the tape, and it was all a setup from the beginning. Yeah, you think? Mark lays out his two options here, leave and never find out what it all means, or keep his cool and keep digging deeper. He knows that his aunt has all of his dad's old files and tasks Mark to find out if he happens to have any on Melody. On to the next tape, we're back with Mel and Jess, where they run into the aforementioned Father Russo. He immediately invites her to attend service, Mel giving a half-hearted maybe in response. Digging through some tapes in a store, she finds the secret of Nim, beaming that she loved the book as a kid. And of course, Jess has never heard of it. She purchases an infamous Pixel Vision camera, designed for kids back in the 90s with absolutely awful video quality, saying that she too, like Mel, is a filmmaker. She hides it along with some comics and other contraband to keep secret from her ever absent mother. She meets another resident, Cassandra, who seems more than a little off to me, inviting her up for some tea this afternoon. Another lady, Beatrice, a proclaimed psychic, also feels that the people here are a bit strange, but well beyond what might be expected, mentioning there's some kind of sex club that meets at the community room in the middle of the night. She can hear all the moaning all the way up here. Presumably the same weird chance Mel heard in the vents. Didn't really sound that sexy to me necessarily. Evil and sexy. Beatrice gives her a tarot card reading that reveals more clues to her history. Her past is filled with grief, thinking that she must have suffered as a child. In the present, she feels something hidden has guided her here. Someone specifically. Mel tells her about trying to track down Julia, and Beatrice gives her a potential lead on a woman on the fourth floor who no one has seen in years. The future is looking bleak too, pulling out the card of death. But Beatrice chuckles, it does have many meanings. Well, also still meaning death too. Mel checks out the mailbox, discovering a piece of mail sticking out from the mystery lady. Sam catches her in the act and offers her a skeleton key that she can use if she's really that desperate to get inside. He invites her to Tamara's one act show that she's doing, hoping to rally an audience as it's not very good. Yeah, sounds great. Tamara's one act opera. Woo. Getting ready for the show, she gets a surprise call from none other than Dr. Turner, Dan's dad, confirming that she was indeed a patient of his, feeling that they made good progress in the past. He asks to call him back, but she is not interested in reconnecting, immediately stomping over and deleting the message. He calls Mark to inform him of what he learned, and the red-hooded stranger is back. He chases after him, but loses him at a barbed wire fence. He then attempts to reach Virgil, wanting to know if someone else is here with him at the facility, and the lady on the phone immediately assumes that he must be mentally distressed. He maintains his cool, saying that it's just a question, nothing more. Again, it's like people want him to lose his marbles. It's like every chance, you need a shrink? You good, bro? He talks over things with his pal Ratty, and he's shocked to find that secret of Nim tape on the shelf, confident that his pal will like it. After putting it on, the man is back, who turns out it's actually his dad. He follows him downstairs, around several winding corridors. Walking by another, it appears that he's suddenly in a different location entirely, somehow at the Visser himself. He sees someone down the hall at their door. He walks up after and knocks, and shockingly, it's Mel that opens up. Right as she does so, though, he wakes up back in the compound. The next tape is at Tamara's show, which of course Mel films the entire 
entire time. The stage is covered in people wearing white masks, dancing around to a weird thumping soundtrack. It intensifies into that eerie theme tune, which again affects Mel. The lights flash, intensely hearing her heartbeat quicken, and Sam whisks her away. We learn that he's a teacher at Columbia, and he asks about her camera, Mel telling him that it was a present from her mom, wanting to follow in her footsteps, especially after her somewhat recent passing. She brings up the big rumor about the sex club, and he can't help but laugh, correcting that she must be referring to the Visser Historical Society. He's not technically a member, he alleges, but does talks there on occasion. The last one about Dutch witchcraft that existed until the 20th century in Lower Manhattan. Hmm, I wonder if that has any relevance here. Uh, yeah. They walk back to the Visser, and Sam hands over that skeleton key for her after all, and she kind of randomly starts making out with him. Seems kind of sudden, but you know, whatever. He runs off to get some booze, and she takes a chance to open the mailbox, but alas, it's empty. Her romantic interlude is interrupted by Annabelle showing up, already asking all kinds of questions about the hot guy she saw from the window. Geez, she's kind of a lot, huh? Sam arrives, and rather than stick around, elects to do this another time. Annabelle keeps filming, chiding her friend for having so many secrets, she's gonna have to spill them all. The next day, Ratty has made a real mess, and when grabbing a broom, he notices a spot in a wall that sounds hollow. So he busts a hole in it, uncovering a tunnel that leads to another downstairs area. There's even more locked doors awaiting him down there, including one filled with binders marked Wellspring, the same DNA testing company from the opening, meaning that LMG must be connected. He then strangely finds himself in an old chapel and spots initials carved into one of the pews. Virgil appears there, and Dan confronts him about the real reason that he hired him. He knew his dad was on the tapes, right? Virgil maintains that he didn't know for sure and takes him to the Wellspring Records Room. He calls their work here a gift, letting people know who they really are, but closed up shop when sinister agencies wanted access to the data. He pulls out a file on his dad and tells him that he understands if this is all a bit too much, if he's afraid of what he might find. According to reports, authorities said that his father had a breakdown and he was responsible for the fire at the house. Dan is adamant that it was an accident. His father would never do that, but well, he can't know for sure, right? Virgil informing him that he was placed on leave from his job, which Dan didn't know. He offers him a chance to quit here, but Dan refuses to give up and gets right back to the tapes. There, Mel hears more chanting in the vents and decides to track down the source. It's coming from the community room, seeing that it's full of various people, including Sam and Cassandra, all doing the rhythmic breathing in unison. At the front of the room is a cabinet holding a white statue. They wrap up the chant and everyone hugs. After they leave, she investigates the box, seeing it's the same symbol from outside the building emblazoned on it. Attempting to get it open, Tamara and Sam return, sending her hiding to the closet, where she has to sit silently while they pork, making weird animalistic growling sounds. <laughs> okay then. She frantically later tells Annabelle about what she saw, and upon hearing it, thinks that they should just leave. It's not that simple. As Mel isn't really here for her project, she reveals, she's looking for her birth mother, Julia Bennett. She got a letter from her, and the viscer was on the return address. Even if she wants nothing to do with her, not knowing her mom has been eating at her her whole life, saying that she needs to know who she is. Annabelle vows to stay with her no matter what, and there's a knock at the door, seeing it's Dan, tying back to his previous dream. Hmm, some kind of weird dream connection thing going on here. When she opens the door, no one is there. Dan meets up with Mark in town, revealing the increasingly complicated puzzle to him. The song the cult has been chanting is the same that his sister played on the piano when they were kids. Everything is somehow connected. As for LMG, Mark has found that it has its hands in many different industries, real estate, defense, and even synthetic gemstone manufacturing. The iceberg is so huge that Wellspring didn't even show up, so it must be an offshoot of an offshoot of an offshoot. He was unable to find any of his dad's files, but did discover a wealth of recordings of his sessions, handing over a bag all marked with Mel's names. Well, that's a good lead. Dan struggles to figure out how the relationship soured, but Mark has another surprise for him. Apparently, Mel didn't die in the fire. She's alive and well in Pittsburgh. Whoa, mind blow. Listening to the tapes, Mel fills his dad in on the specifics of her past. Her mom left her at St. Joseph, also leaving her a necklace with a ring attached. She spent the next 10 years there and was always in trouble. The nun's calling her damaged goods. When writing, something takes over her and she starts scribbling circle patterns on the page. She doesn't know what they are, but feels something pulling her, having to describe it to 
to keep her from falling inside of it. She had these visions frequently until she left the church, but recently they have returned. Steven is confident they can at least pinpoint her issues, and they're visited by a fluffy friend, Cleo. So they did meet, and the connection he first picked up on wasn't so crazy after all. As he wisely doesn't trust Virgil at this point, Dan scours the house for more cameras, and also found, despite him saying there's no internet, finds a mass of data cables. He was actually able to tap into it, and now has access to all the cameras in the house, so he can figure out where exactly he has privacy. Staring at a map, he suddenly appears in the community room with Mel, noticing little particles floating in the air. They can definitely see each other, and formally introduce themselves. She whispers that the building is pretty weird, right? And of course he agrees. She then invites him out for a casual drink, like a Fanta or something, and there's a knock at the door that brings him back to the bathroom. Looks like there's some kind of in-between dream world that Mel is reaching out to Dan through. There's a woman at the door saying her name is Bobby and that she works for Virgil. She excuses that she was supposed to put him in a different room as there's mold in this one. He's confused as there is no mold and dismisses her saying he needs his privacy. Mel then returns to the community room with Annabelle detailing what she saw the last night. Cassandra enters acting weird as always, sniffing Annabelle and calling her lovely. On the subject of last night, she fibs that she wasn't there, despite us clearly seeing otherwise. Something shady is definitely going on up in here. She visits Jess, who appears troubled, and speaks about more vague yet ominous things, such as not wanting to wait anymore. Mel asks if she should call her mom, but Jess doesn't want that. She'll just send her to Russo again, who always blames her for not trying hard enough at her faith. Mel sighs that she knows all about how churches try to help, but offers that she did find someone that really did help her. She tells Annabelle about her plan to reach out to Steven after all for Jess, and she's annoyed at Mel always bringing in strays. This sends Dan to the audio tapes, where he finds their joint meeting. Jess isn't so sure how long she's been having these episodes. When trying to describe how her thing feels, she says it's like being pulled somewhere, and she comes right back. Mel and Steven talk after, him thinking that it could be a number of things, but won't know for sure without a full medical workup. Her mom storms in, and obviously Jess didn't actually ask her permission to come here, even though she told Mel that she did. Mel attempts to apologize, but she tells her to stay out of her business and leaves in a huff. Well, that didn't go well. It also shows how much distance there is in Jess and her mom's relationship. I mean, she's never around. What is she supposed to do? You know, she needs help. Mark makes it to Melody's house, and she's willing to answer some questions, but honestly doesn't really remember anything of note about what happened or with Steven or anything. The interview really doesn't go anywhere. As Mark pieces together later, this isn't actually Mel at all. Working on another tape, he cracks it, sending him downstairs, and again finds himself teleported into the apartment stairwell. The particles are back along with Mel. She smiles about waiting for him, thinking that they were supposed to get sodas. She gets upset, thinking that she probably got it wrong, and blames herself that she keeps messing things up. He tells her resolutely that she does not, and he definitely feels that he knows her, saying that she's a good person who cares about people. It's a feature, not a bug, he smiles. He wakes up and is right on to the next tape, where Mel seeks out more info on Father Russo. They set up an interview where they express differing views on religion. For him, the church offered answers to his internal darkness, which Mel calls a nice sentiment, but not exactly the experience she had. They're drawn away by screaming outside, finding Jess having another seizure. Russo is able to calm her down, assuring her that she is in God's hands, and curtly turns down an ambulance, choosing to pray over her instead. Back with Annabelle, she spots a stuffed animal and picks it out for the girl, Anna again scolding her about taking in strays. She shoots back that it's a gift, not a bug, just as Dan told her. At her place, they hear her calling for help and furniture scratching. Tamara nearby knows that Russo must be over as they always turn up the TV when he's there, and thanks to her extra key, they are able to get inside. It's just in time to see Russo basically trying to perform an exorcism, pouring water down the girl's throat. He tries to argue that he's helping her, and Sam steps in to save the day, growling that we're done here. Sam talks directly to Erica, calling that man a fraud who can't actually help her. She needs real help. She's smart enough to finally agree, taking her daughter in her arms, both sobbing emotionally. She confronts Russo, calling him no different than the rest, but he defends that she doesn't know what's going on here. There's a terrible darkness at play, and she should leave while she still can. Dan was at least able to convince Bobby to unlock the private church for him, and has a plan to explore the basement using a loop of footage of the empty halls. Now, he just needs the code. Mark informs him about Mel, that it wasn't really her. In fact, she bought her identity. It seems that faux Mel couldn't get her life together 
and so she stole one. But as he reluctantly tells Dan, the only way that this could have worked is if the real Mel is dead. He insists that it's fine and hangs up, but it's clear that this has a big impact on him. Back at the store, Mel turns right to the lens and pulls up a Fanta, taking a drink. Cheers, he weakly replies. She goes on that she's been thinking about what he said and that it really meant a lot to her. He asks in disbelief, is this really happening? And she shrugs, casually asking, yeah, why wouldn't it? Mel is forced to tend with Annabelle outside, leaving the frame completely empty. That is until Cassandra enters, going right up to the lens. Stay out, she groans and reaches for him through the monitor, Dan shrieking awake. Our next vintage video features an important estate auction from 1988, all belonging to a woman, Eleanor, who was part of a group called the Spirit Receiver Movement. They were a bunch of abstract artists who believed that their art acted as mediums for supernatural messages from the spirit realm and beyond. In 74, her and her sister Cassandra moved to New York and set up a gallery to show off their group's work. Now that she's passed, her collection is up for grabs, featuring all kinds of spiritual pieces, including photographs of spirits from the 1800s, a tuning fork from the 14th century, and a lady's comet pen made from something called Karenite. And naturally, also amongst the collection is that darn cabinet and statue. Dan returns to the archives and feebly tries random numbers, as well as bashing at the glass to no effect. He phones Mark to find someone to hack it and runs into Melody out in the woods. Neither know exactly how she got here, and Bobby calls his name bringing him back to reality, seeing that it's somehow nighttime though, even though it was just daylight as we saw. He gets a ring from Virgil, annoyed that he didn't upload anything today, and Dan promises he'll get right back to it. With Jess, she seems to be doing better, and amongst her books finds one that is a catalog of comets. She's writing about one in particular, Karen, that used to be extremely popular with songs about it and everything. Thing. But over time, all comets break down and eventually disappear. Karen is supposed to be passing by again sometime soon. Good old Sam got her a telescope and they're gonna watch it together. The girls go over to Cassandra's for an interview and she is surprisingly forthcoming about her and her sister's spiritual activities. When Eleanor passed, she wanted her to auction off the collection, but she decided to keep it instead. Mel goes right for the cabinet and she excuses that she misplaced the key. Hmm, sure you did. She starts pressing her about the building and their cult, cast divulging that they belong to the spirit receivers group that was mentioned in the opening, admitting some did refer to them as a cult. She's wearing the same pendant from the earlier painting of her, informing him it's made of Karenite, just like the pen, and of course referring to the comet. Mel stares into the surface and her reflection becomes oddly distorted. She retrieves a special gift for Annabelle, a jar of paint mixed by Eleanor, her excited about what she might conjure up. They run into Sam and thank him for getting Jess to a real doctor and she broaches the subject of their weird cold thing and he deflects that what she saw was just another run through of Tamara's opera but with new material sure dude about to switch tapes Dan catches Mel in the dark screen but of course nobody is there when he turns back he's back to his childhood home seeing his sister reading notes she asks if he wants to hear a ghost story but even as a kid he doesn't believe she tells him well daddy does that they're all around us asking hasn't he seen some she assures him there is nothing to be afraid of though they're just lost and don't know where to go. Dan wakes up to wrestling in another room, coming to Melody sitting on the bed, flipping through that notebook that he found earlier. She has this fancy box too, which is confusing to him as he's never brought it into this room. He tells her it was from his dad, that he used to collect old films at flea markets, which might be Dan's own inspiration for his hunts. She sees that it's all busted up and Dan tells her that he smashed it after he died, as he discovered that his dad wasn't who he thought he was. As it was all that he had left of his dad, he ultimately decided to keep the paces. Mel can relate, fingering the ring on her necklace left by her mom. She's thrown it away countless times, but can't ever bear to let it go for good. But both still haven't been able to forgive them just yet. He brings out that she actually knows his dad to her shock, especially as the Dan she knows is only a kid. How could that be? Hearing this, the lights go haywire and explode, plunging them into darkness. She's gone, but the belongings still remain. He flips to the last page, seeing it's marked T. Bellows, and discovers a pile of other journals in the closet, all with the same name inside. One has pages and pages of random numbers. And then he comes to the last one that's circled. He tries it out on the basement door and huzzah, it works. He rifles through the drawers, finding something that his dad wrote regarding night terrors, as well as paranormal perception in adults. He figures that this must have been what got him in trouble with NYU, writing about parapsychology. And even he didn't know how much he believed in this kind of stuff. Well, we'll find out why. There's also some belongings from the Visser, including the teeth bowl we saw along with more tapes and pictures, and finally Mel's own.
own burnt journal. He explains to Mark how he found the code, which must have been from someone that worked there before, but don't know what a guy was doing up here watching old soap opera tapes. Virgil surprises Mark at his studio and already knows him as Dan's BFF, showing he knows more than he's letting on as usual. He also too knows that Mark has been in contact the whole time with his bud and even knows that Mark footed the bill for his stay at a facility after Dan's breakdown. Mark clarifies Jill didn't cause the breakdown itself, but that it triggered old family shit. Certainly again, referring to the fire and losing his family. When he found Dan not doing well, he agreed to get him some help. I mean, just being a good friend. Virgil insists that he is truly concerned and wants to help him out. He doesn't want to be his spy, but Virgil believes that they're on the same side. He inquires what's so important about the tapes, but he only tells him that it's confidential, handing him a business card just in case. Annabelle is already hard at work utilizing Eleanor's paint, feeling that it's like a portal into her soul. She likes to stay behind for now, leaving Mel on her own at Cassandra's dinner party. Jess answers the door, now her wearing the Karenite necklace. She immediately goes for the cabinet, but is distracted by another lady, Patricia, who is happy to be interviewed. She's been here the longest so far, it seems, since way back in 1962. She used to work as a nurse, but is now retired and just records things, mainly soap operas. Hmm. She strangely says that she feels they have a message for her, but refuses to elaborate further. She then meets another lady, Helen, who designs masks, including those used for Tamara's performance. When the conversation turns to the cult, she starts acting shifty and excuses herself to go mingle. Man, these people don't even hide it very well, do they? Sam arrives with a special guest in tow, Evie Crest, who we remember in present day hired Dan with the footage from her dad, the guy who made the Circle movie we saw. They bring up her father's work and the Circle specifically. Cassandra heard rumors that it was inspired by a real snuff film, which Evie tells her is true. Her dad went to a bachelor party at an old occult lodge in the Hollywood Hills, as LA used to be a major hub for the occult. After dinner, they brought the guests underground to watch a film. Her mom was certain that it was a hoax featuring some kind of gruesome sacrifice. True or not, this was the real inspiration behind William's film. Cassandra seems particularly interested in getting a copy for herself, but Evie doesn't have any as far as she knows. She does still have unresolved feelings regarding William's death, and they mention that they could try and contact him with Beatrice's assistance. Evie is down, and the group goes to mingle in another room, as Mel returns immediately to the cabinet. She's caught in the act by Sam, who offers up his skeleton key. She opens it, and the sculpture inside has definitely changed, Cass calling it a self-portrait. I mean, everyone is in on this thing, right? It's pretty obvious at this point. Beatrice does her thing, calling forth to the spirits to move through her, and reaches out to William. It appears to work, recalling an Emily Dickinson book that he gifted her as a child, and Cassandra returns to her own line of questioning regarding that snuff film. The party, it turns out, was at her godfather's house, which shocks Evie, and Beatrice's voice turns demonic, bellowing to stay away from, and she loses the connection. And they then turn to Melody. Is there someone that she wants to contact? She says no, as she still believes her mother isn't dead, but they don't know for sure that she's still alive either. This time, calling out for Julia. Everyone waits for a sign, but Beatrice doesn't feel any kind of presence from the realm of the dead. She then groans that there's someone else here. Dan spins back to Mel there with him, explaining that he's restoring her own tapes. She stares intently at Beatrice's face, thinking that she recognizes her, but can't remember anything specifically. He asks if she remembers his name. Dan, she smiles, saying that he lives in the building with her. He corrects that he's never actually been there. Wait, didn't they meet in the community room? Well, not technically. They were in that in-between thing. And Mel spots her journal nearby. He says that he found it that way and also pulls out her necklace, leaving her even more confused how he's got all of her stuff. He remembers what his sister told him about ghosts being lost and now believes that correlates with Mel. He lays it out to her blankly that she died in the fire 24 years ago and she doesn't believe him, calling him crazy. He tells her the whole purpose of his work is to find out what happened to her as well as what caused the fire. Mel loses it on him, adamant that she's not dead. Her getting upset again causes the lights to click off and she's gone, the tape starting itself back up. Beatrice's eyes glaze over to white and she starts to recite word for word everything Dan and Mel have talked about up to this point. They're both baffled across time, especially when she includes the convo that they literally just had a few moments ago. Dan finally starts understanding this can't be a dream. It's all real and some crazy time hopping supernatural shenanigans afoot. He tells Mark the good news as this means that there is still a chance for him to save her. He rants to him about his plan, which to Mark is sounding pretty nuts by now. Beatrice keeps rambling, repeating to go. 
She suddenly screams and begins to tear at her own face, everyone screaming to stop, demanding to call an ambulance. Mel tries to ask her how she knew about all that stuff with Dan, but she's in no state for answering questions, getting carted off to the hospital. Yeah, she doesn't have a face at the moment. She comes home to more complications. Annabelle has been on a painting rampage, the whole place covered in dark random patterns and circles. She claims that there is someone in there, within the walls, that is communicating with her. Okay. Static garbles in, and the creature appears, momentarily interrupting the noise. Waiting with Beatrice at the hospital, she goes to fetch some coffee, and finds herself back in the in-between particle zone. Dan appears, causing her to spill her drink, and this time she wakes up, just as he does after each of their encounters. They are definitely communicating in an in-between space between their two times, occurring independently or at the same time, you know, like all time at once, that kind of whole thing. She tries again to rouse Beatrice for some questions, and she can at least tell her that the other person that she was feeling isn't dead. Well, obviously Dan. She grabs her hand and growls in a demonic voice, don't let it out. Yeah, whatever it is, let's not. Good idea. She seeks out Stephen's help, but finds that he's already been placed on leave. So she goes to his house and explains about the dream conversations, yet she couldn't remember any specifics. That is, until the seance. Suddenly, she remembered everything about him all at once, and explains that it was actually his son that she's seeing. Remembering Stephen got put on leave, he actually thought Mel was the one who filed the complaint against him as payback for something that he did six months ago. A researcher put out a call looking for people with certain sensitivities, calling them ball dung. Mel's profile seemed to fit exactly what they were seeking, including a genetic predisposition for psychic perception. Well, there you go. That at least explains some of what's been going on here, being able to reach out to Dan through time and all that stuff. She's got psychic powers. She asked if it could be real, and he doesn't rule out that it isn't, but it is still almost likely in her head. She knows that it's all real and can prove it thanks to her tapes, and tells him she's gonna send some over. Back at the building, she runs into Jess, clutching a jar of something odd, but will not tell her who it's for. Mel suspects it's for Samuel, seeing she's going to the top floor, we know he lives there. At the apartment, there's no sign of Annabelle, and goes to ask Jess about it, but mom doesn't even want her around anymore. She goes back and rewatches the seance footage, and the tape gets distorted, hearing strange voices. A demonic snarl rings out, and it appears to her briefly. She packs up the tape and ships it to Steve, and it is definitely not all in her mind. That is for sure by now. Jess does come by and tells her she knows where Annabelle is at Cassandra's. Understandably worried, Cassandra turns the blame on her, always smothering her friend. Here, she can have the freedom to find herself. In need of more space to work, she also set her up with an apartment on the sixth floor. That one place Smith warned her to avoid at all costs. Jeez, wonder what's going on up there. Time to find out. She finds Annabelle completely consumed in her work, and she seems kind of changed in a way, beaming that the building is special. It speaks to me, and really feels connected with something here. Mel, on the other hand, thinks that it is time to leave. Finding Julia or not, this place has become way too unsafe. Annabelle's too far gone, gushing to her that Cassandra got her a spot in a local art show, and pushes her out of the door so she can get back to paint. She hears that distinct chanting coming from behind another door, which we see oddly locks on the outside, trying to keep something in, you know what I mean? The place is a rundown hovel, her also noticing a strange black shimmering substance growing on the walls. She is startled by a group of people all hunched over, appearing strung out, and another group is in a circle chanting together in the kitchen. They all stop and stare at her menacingly, and another dude pops up asking if Russo sent her. Smith enters, reminding her of what he said, scooping the man away. Mel tries to get more info from him, but he's characteristically tight-lipped. He does at least explain what's up with the hovel people. They're all addicts, and a kind of penance for losing his sister to drugs, Sam leases out the floor to keep them warm and safe. See, he's doing a good thing. Definitely not a bad guy at all. No way. Back in her room, that same junkie guy, Chris, appears on the fire escape, and when she mentions Julia, he tells her that he can help, as long as she helps him, too. He sits down to be taped, and he can't exactly remember how long he's been here. He calls the drugs they take stardust. That's what brought them here and what keeps them here as well. It's actually made from that shimmering mold that she saw upstairs, saying that it runs through the building like dark veins. You take one hit and it's like a whole other world opens up. When she tries to ask what he knows about Julia, he is not much help whatsoever. And even if she had been here, he wouldn't remember her because all the drugs. Thanks for the help, Swiss cheese brain. He is distracted by a sound coming from the wall and hums along with our favorite song. It starts affecting her and she tries to get back to the point, but he will not tell her more unless she can get him a bed
bed down at the church. He does want to get clean, he claims, and get out of here once and for all. He worries that if he doesn't get out of here soon, the ferryman's gonna come drag him and everyone else here to hell. Ferryman, Karen, Karenite, more on that later. No time like the present, and Mel heads down to the church, where she's shocked to see a vigil for Russo, a lady telling him that he fell in front of a train late last night. Well, that doesn't sound suspicious. She bursts into his office to poke around, and when finding his keys, it's right to that secret log cabinet. We discover that Russo was a lot more aware of all the strangers at the Visser and its history. There's a blueprint of the building along with a timeline. The Voss Mansion completed in 1920, then the Voss Society in 1924, along with the comet Karen, and gas explosion also in 1924. Then as Mel mentioned when first coming to the Visser, the apartment was actually built right on top of the Voss Mansion. Sounds like weird religious cult stuff has been going on on these grounds for a long time. She also finds a book there on occult and demonology, and when flipping through the pages, finds the exact statue from the cabinet listed. It represents Calego, both a god and demon, according to the legend. And it's definitely the white guy that pops up in the screens and everything. Yep. In another book's pages, she stumbles across another surprise. There are various pages showing different identities for Samuel, telling us he's been lying about himself from the very beginning. Digging deeper into the witchcraft book, there's another familiar term, the Baldung Cult, as Steve even mentioned. She sees a symbol and realizes it's the exact same one from her mother's necklace, meaning she must have been somehow involved in this Baldung cult. The massive revelations all piling up quickly, she has to run and hide when Sam comes in, probably looking for what she just took. At the least, he does rip off the last note about the train meeting from Rousseau's calendar, implying he's covering his own tracks. That's a train joke. She rushes to a payphone to tell Stephen everything about her mom and the Baldung. When handing up, Dan appears there briefly in the reflection. Her pager starts buzzing and it's Annabelle. Mel totally forgot all about her big art show. Arriving at the gallery, she gratefully gulps down the free wine to calm her nerves. Annabelle gives her grief for being late, but she's got her mind still on the viscer, telling her that we are leaving tonight. Annabelle is kind of off on her own planet now and drags her over to check out her mini pieces. They're all dark portraits of what seems to be the same woman. Annabelle doesn't even know who the woman is, but again knows that she's in there and she is the one communicating communicating with her. Mel is still not getting it. Annabelle scoffing, you know, the other plays. The paint lets you see it. She boasts that she's a real life spirit receiver herself now. Mel goes to touch the paint and now knows that it is too made from the Visser's special mold mix. Across the way, Annabelle gets into an argument, yelling to the dealer that her paintings aren't for sale. You'd think she'd be happy they sold, but not so much. She starts ripping them off the walls and grows aggravated, even shoving Mel to the ground, groaning Cassandra is right. She's always smothering her. Woo wee, seems like something in that mold stuff kind of changed her quite a bit. She runs into Sam and tries to get to the bottom of all of his mysteries, the junkies, the fake names, along with the possibility that he killed Russo because he figured him out. He plays it all off completely, accusing her that she must be on drugs or something. Out of nowhere, Chris's body plummets to the earth. Passerbys start gathering around, and next to Sam, there's another surprising visitor, Virgil, stepping out to join the onlookers. Dan is perplexed once more and addresses Virgil directly through the camera, calling him a liar, and screams to know who he really is. Virgil does show up later, and divulges at least another layer to his ever-deepening plan. He's never going to tell you the truth completely, Dan. Sam was his brother, lamenting that he had potential, but channeled it into all the wrong places. It's Virgil's belief that Melody actually killed Sam, and that the proof is somewhere in the footage. As for the whole supposed cult thing, he dismisses it all as harmless. Some knickknacks and a bunch of gullible people. And it was Mel that got it in her head about Julia living there, and when she couldn't find her, it says that she turned her rage on to Samuel, even that she's the one that set the fire that killed him and the others. Dan refuses to believe she'd ever do that, again, truly feeling that he knows her after watching so many hours of footage. But Virgil maintains his own feelings, even entertaining the notion that Mel also set the fire at his house. I mean, I could be, I guess, right? There was something weird going on with her and Steven. He doesn't know for sure. The only way, as Virgil tells him, is to finish the tapes. Maybe that that way they can both get closure. Our next vintage video is the opening scene of William Crest's Lost Circle movie. It does feel right out of the Twilight Zone concerning the idea of a world other than our own. If that world exists, it's believed at the center of it is the circle, the title fading on screen. So we know his film was based on a real film, and so this definitely is a situation we've got brewing on our hands here. Trying to reach another dimension. Dan finally confronts the past via repairing the tape that his dad left him. As Stephen wishing him a happy 
birthday before launching into a showcase of classic flicks so he can watch all the hits on his own. He gets a call from Mark, who has made his way to the facility, worried as he hasn't heard from him recently. Dan lets him down that he can't let him in and about to walk off, Mark tells him that he found Thomas Bellows. He did work here a few years back and his job was to go through a bunch of old soap opera tapes, obviously Patricia's aforementioned substantial collection. Apparently he suffered from paranoid delusions ever since and sometime later wound up in a fatal car wreck. Now Mark is worrying the same thing is happening to him. He insists as always that he's fine and proceeds to take out every camera in the house, Virgil watching it all not looking too pleased. But come on, you know this guy, he's got secret cameras too, right? Looks like he's only got one last tape to get through, which starts on the floor, then panning up to Mel asleep in bed, meaning someone else is filming her. She wakes up looking confused by her surroundings, and after seeing the fresh tape plays back the alarming footage. She finds a package, now knowing that she's at Sam's place, and I bet he was the one taping her too. We know you're actually a weirdo, dude, just admit it. The cops want to ask her some questions about Chris's death, and she takes the opportunity to blame Sam for everything. But the proof that she has is somehow no longer in her bag. That crafty bastard must have stolen it. She keeps rambling, and sounds not exactly credible again, being asked if she's the one on drugs. She gets a call, learning that Annabelle has been taken to a mental health facility. Apparently, during her freakout, she broke the gallery owner's jaw and stabbed a security officer in the eye with a nail. Yeesh, lady. In a day, she says that she has a message, that she's here, but doesn't reveal who exactly it is. The doc knows she was hallucinating, but according to the toxicology reports, it's not because of drugs. This leaves Mel wondering if somehow the mold could be behind it, and he says it is possible a neurotoxin could cause similar episodes. Well, there you go. Psychedelic mold. She storms over to Cassandra's, blaming her for what happened, as she gave her the pain in the first place. It was also her that purchased the paintings, proudly saying that her friend has become a true spirit receiver and opened a door. Jess steps in, looking worried at the tense scene, and Mel tries to get her to leave with her. She doesn't budge, saying that according to Samuel, she shouldn't see her anymore. She dubs him a liar and feebly tries to convince her Cass and Sam aren't actually good people. She gets closer, scaring Jess and causing her to drop her tea. Mel then realizes Cass must have been dosing Jess the mold in the tea. She knows at least that that jar she saw earlier must have been the mold, and even after the weirdness, Jess still agrees to help her get a sample. She descends down into the basement and sees that the mold has covered the entire walls down here and inlaid are an abundance of circle patterns. Again, as Crest said, the circle must be the origin of the door. She removes some from the wall, hearing that same wheezy chanting kick in. There's another door there, sounding like where the noises are emanating from. She spins back to Samuel, and the tape gets eaten. He pulls it out, and somehow the mold has completely infected it. The same goes for the tape deck now, covered in the black shimmering mass. He calls Virgil, and is sounding even crazier than ever, him turning this into a potential mental emergency. Dan is resolute that he's fine, and Virgil then calmly reminds him that he requested a backup deck. He finds it along with an old digital camera, learning that it belonged to Terry. He too kept a video log for his girlfriend, detailing his time at the facility. He also doesn't understand the importance of digitizing these shitty old soap operas, but does his duty anyway. And though it doesn't matter much, it was his along with his girlfriend's initials carved into the pews, so he must have also started exploring like Dan and found the chapel. He also soon starts going nuts and complains the job is sucking the life out of him, but stays strong thanks to the promise of all that cash at the end. As we also know, he found the code to the Wellspring room, and after diving into the info there, determines that it's actually all just a front for collecting personal data, and believes that Virgil was actually looking for someone specifically. Even more alarmingly, he finds a massive fridge full of blood containers, wondering what the hell that's for. He breaks down further later, sobbing about a face that he saw on the screen, thinking that it was watching him. He groans, fuck you, Patricia, and your tapes. What did you do? Sounds like just like with Mel's tapes, Patricia's were kind of cursed in a way, as they also originated in the viscer. Dan brings up her old interview that confirms this notion, her saying again that she felt there was a message for her in them. Sick of all the secrets, Dan smashes his way into the other room and pulls out one tape, marked LMG. He removes a label, seeing the original underneath, now knowing for sure that these are all Patricia's tapes. He catches Mark up on Thomas's unraveling, as well as the connection with the tapes, but the call suddenly cuts off. And Bobby, as usual, rolls out of nowhere. He brings up Thomas, and she warns him not to make the same mistake he did. Finish the job, 
job and walk away. At an arty looking indie bookstore, Mark is there waiting for none other than Jill, aka Dan's ex. He's heard rumor that Evie Crest suffered a stroke, and since passing, they're going to sell off all of William's sought after collection. He somehow knows that she got them, and implies the only reason she knows about any of this is due to Dan's obsession with the Circle movie. She calls Crest a real nutter into all kinds of strange things, but this stuff is different. The papers are all about an obscure cult in New York. Any guesses as to the name? Yep, the Boss Society. Although they didn't seem to make much of a long-term impact. She shows off a picture of the Boss family, led by Iris, who came over from Europe after World War I. And it was their house that burned down, on top of which the Visser was built. Then there is his other inspiration, the supposed snuff film. And she doesn't have the original, but does at least have a copy they can get a look at. We can make out a group in a room, and someone pours blood onto the Caligo statue. It seems that word of it being cursed is well known, as three other archive places turn down the collection. Mark smirks, well it's your lucky day, as he's gonna take it all off her hands. Dan motivates himself to just finish this thing, and picks up right at the breaking point. As for showing up in his apartment, Sam says that she fainted, and without a key to her place, simply carried her to his. He lamely apologizes if this scared her, but didn't want to leave her out on the street, you know. She asks him about the mold everywhere down here, and he unbelievably keeps playing dumb, guessing it must be water damage or something. Mel knows better, calling his bluff. He's been scraping the stuff off the walls and using it to poison people, and asks again what it is. He finally lets the nice guy facade drop, chuckling that it's proof of their devotion. A manifestation of the divine, the body and blood. He calls her over with something to show her, knowing that she's been searching for answers her whole life, and claims he has them if she's willing to listen. At the tease of that, he brings her into another room. The room is the same one from that old footage with Iris, hearing that ever-present tune start up. He tells her that it's not a song, but rather a prayer, and he's well aware that it is painful to her, and he reveals that he was looking for her this whole time. It was due to her reaction that night at the opera. That's how he knew for sure that she was who he was looking for. Sam scoffs at the word cult, giving them the haughtier title of pioneer Pioneers of the imagination, voyagers and seers. Then it's time for the big question regarding her mom, and he does have the answer, but it's not one that she'll like. He never actually knew her mom ever, and she never lived here. It was him that sent the letter to the convent, knowing that her mother would be enough to lure her here. And it was all thanks to Stephen's tip in the research thing that he was able to find her in the first place, him being the researcher that he discussed previously. He also does know the history of her name and who she is, a ball dung, and there's not many left of them out there. He's confident that this time that they'll succeed, and all time will be as one. He continues that he is merely a link in the chain, a keeper of the flame, and flips on the projector to the same ritual with Iris. She slits a lady's throat and lifts her arms, beginning to chant. Mel is terrified, thinking this means they're going to kill her, but Sam clarifies they can't. They need her for the ritual. Besides, the vessel has already been chosen, and it's capable of holding an entire new world inside of them, offering that she'll even be reunited with her mother there. Mel is on edge, growling for him to fuck off. Dan watches as she flees back to her apartment and breaks down on the bed. Can't really blame her, there a lot going on around here, but it is her mom that hits her the most, thinking that her entire journey and search was for nothing. She decides now is finally the time to leave, but Sam's words give her pause. The birth of the new world thing being exactly what Jess told her a whole ways back, and she figures out that she must have been selected to be the group's vessel. Well, so much for leaving, because she is definitely not going to leave just behind. At their apartment, only Tamara is there, but it definitely looks emptied of all their belongings. She runs back into the hall, bringing us back to the beginning with full context this time. She cries that they took her and runs into Smith. The other way, Sam is there blocking her, calmly telling her that Jess is gone, and suggests to go talk someplace quiet. She's not falling for it anymore, but is stopped in her tracks by the attendants coming for her. She records her plea for help, and tries to run as Steven enters promising everything is gonna be fine. The guy grabs her, and she drops the camera, Stephen giving Sam a knowing look on the way out. Dan rewinds, and Static takes over, revealing Kalego once more. He pushes his face through the screen, and Dan retrieves his trusty wrench to smash it. The entity simply moves to another, and then another, starting to step out into the real world, but Dan manages to smash it every time before he can. He next unleashes his destruction on the entire collection of tapes. On a swing back, he cracks into to another hollow spot in the wall, seeing the sparkling mold on the other side. He pushes over the shelves, uncovering a door underneath, and climbs down, 
seeing that he's at the same stairs we just saw Sam and Mel at, meaning the boss ritual room is now under the facility, or is perhaps an exact recreation. Entering the area, monitors are there looping a bunch of clips of Melody, noticing some strange high-tech equipment on the wall, and the tapes start looping into one moment. Melody's initial cry for help that led Dan down this whole crazy journey, all to try and prevent her death, or at least find out what happened. About to bash the screen, he turns back and is knocked out by an unknown assailant. Before we see what happens, we shift gears to another lingering question of things, the care uncommon. An old film reel tells us that it comes every 70-ish years, it's briefly visible from Earth before it disappears again into space. It was named Karen after the ferryman of Hades, who carries souls into the afterlife. It was first discovered in the 1700s, and evidence suggests that it was actually once part of a cosmic pair, and that its twin comet at some point crashed on Earth, leaving Karenite here, which is a rare, precious gemstone. But now we know where Cass's necklace came from, along with that comet pin we saw in their collection. It's actually made from this gemstone and tied directly to the Karen comet. Dan gasps awake in his old bed, and when checking his head, there's strangely no sign of injury. He flashes his teeth, seeing they're all black, covered in the viscer's mold. He starts vomiting up a bunch of black stuff and wakes up again. Oh no, the dreaded double dream. He digs through his stuff but can't find his phone, asking a neighbor to borrow his. A call to LMG goes straight to voicemail, so he decides to visit in person. Virgil appears on a screen, thanking him for his excellent work, but Dan demands to know how he wound up back here. Virgil continues the he went nuts narrative, saying that he must have been pushed too far and was simply exhausted. Everything is all backed up by the doctor's paperwork that he has. He fires off a list of questions, the underground chamber, why is he digitizing the tapes, and Virgil continues to maintain the crazy angle, bringing up that he has footage of him destroying all of his equipment, telling him to take the money and go back to his life. See, I told you he had secret cameras, secret secrets, Virgil. Well, not much you can do there. Definitely got dicked over by Virgil. It's important to note here that it must have been Virgil or someone that works for him that drugged him and brought him home, as Dan got too close to something that he didn't want him to, and presumably it was also Virgil that built the ritual room himself. It doesn't make any sense for anyone else to have, meaning that he was lying also the entire time and knew exactly what the tapes and cult were all about from the beginning. I mean, what, <laughs> how the hell else would he even known about the room in the first place? He's playing dumb, he's not dumb. Dan returns home and reunites with Mark, happy to see him. Still with the SD card in his pocket, he plays him Thomas's footage and brings up again that they both saw something, which he can only describe as not human. Kalego, yes please. Mark knows that it is possible, as people believe film can capture things that we don't see, like ghosts or demons, and he's got something to show him, showing off the freshly acquired William Crest collection. He found out that Evie died after sending him that first tape, and she was apparently obsessed with the Voss Society just like her dad. He knows that they were into human sacrifice and used an instruction manual from the Baldung line of witches, all with the intent of resurrecting Kalego. According to him, most are looking to see Lost Family, but Voss wanted something else. He shows a photo of Iris wearing Cassandra's comet necklace, and Dan now recognizes her too, realizing that's who Annabelle has been painting, the woman reaching out to her from within the walls as she describes. We then flash back to 19 Tickety 4, getting to see Iris and the Voss Society in action. We pretty much know things aren't going to turn out so well, so when they meet the young naive Rose to come work for the family, we already suspect that she's going to be acting as their vessel. She comes along with her own tragic backstory, having lost her whole family on the voyage to America, and just as with Sam, Iris promises that she can see them again. It's an even more direct connection when Iris encourages that she is capable of holding a whole world inside of her. Yeah, you a vessel girl. As for Iris, it's a child that she's after, as her husband died in the war. Her brother enters with another necessary piece to the ritual, the Caligo statue. There's a lot of stuff to keep track of here, including the Karen comet passing by, them knowing that it will be soon close enough to see again, and she's holding a big party to celebrate all the good luck and fortune supposedly it will bring, winking along with the thinning of the veil between worlds. This seems to be the comet's main function in the ritual, actually bringing our worlds closer together for a brief moment for them to seize upon. She shuffles the guests in to take in the statue, knowing their father would be proud. So this thing must have originally started with him back in the old world, and the kids kept it going. They chime on tuning forks, and she starts to call out to Caligo, all being photographed by a dude, which of course becomes the spirit photos that Mark is now in possession of. When developing them, Iris is now confident that they have proof their ritual is working. He must be with us. Iris spells it out for Rose about the other world. They're their god, can 
Grant all kinds of stuff and see everything too. Rose realizing it's not just another world, but a whole other god. Yep. Later the girl is seen tending to black mold growing in the ground, telling Iris of its strange patterns. Again, this, as Iris says, is their god's body and blood pushing through the veil that separates us. Caligo is reaching out to him. She wakes up later hacking up black stuff and is most likely being fed the mold too. She comes to a cloaked woman taking a book and we find out the woman is Baldung. She goes on, they mistakenly released the god once and it nearly destroyed everything. So they now work to make sure it never happens again. Caligo is no savior, but a force of complete and total distraction. Jonah steps out with a gun at the ready. And when she goes to light the book, he fires a fatal shot upon her. Iris is upset as we know they need one of her kind, but now it is too late to find another. Well, that could be one reason your ritual gets screwed up. Just as Sam needs Mel. Rose is worried about what they're doing, but Iris is able to easily manipulate her into believing that they are both seers. She shows her the comet via telescope and the girl is beaming with excitement. It's funny just how similar the relationship here is between them and their equivalent between Sam and Jess. Then there's another problem, her turncoat brother, who's had enough of all the bloodshed and death. Even the people she's using as so-called human batteries for her jailbreak, they don't know they're gonna die, they think it's just a party, asking if it's all worth it for a child. She maintains this is what their father would have wanted for all of us, apparently also spending his life on the subject, he interjects that the reality is he's dead. Her desire to be with him again goes against nature itself. It's not up to a god to save us, but humanity has to figure out their own problems. <laughs> Good luck with that. Iris composes herself and gives a toast to the great comet and all the heavens and night skies. She then cues the band to play the tune, which is appropriately called Other World. A little on the nose there, huh? As everyone cuts a rug, Iris leads Rose down to the ritual room and they're asked to consecrate this moment, this night sky with the great comet, so the fairy man can show us a path through the veil. Everyone puts on their masks, adorned with the Baldung symbol, also like Tamara's opera thing, they begin chanting and call out to the god, we are your true receivers. She drips a blood goblet onto the statue, nourishing the ground in his name, and asks him to forge a passage into the other world. Now it's Rose's turn to fulfill her purpose, asking to empty this vessel to make way for him. This body is yours now. She slits her throat, Rose immediately collapsing. Iris continues, unite our two worlds as one and bring forth his dominion over earth. Now! A glowing kind of electrical tunnel descends upon the circle and envelops her. Dan and Mark are well aware that Sam is trying to recreate the same ritual, but still don't know what happened to Melody, and think of one last name that they haven't looked into, Annabelle. Mark thinks that it's maybe best to just leave this whole thing alone at this point, kind of gotten out of hand here, but Dan is insistent. He needs to know what happened. They stole Melody's life, and he is here to give it meaning. That's enough to convince Mark, and they are shocked to find she's been in the same facility all these years. She opens the door and appears to have been expecting them, asking what took so long. Melody too has been waiting, seeing that her latest subjects are now her friend's face over and over, and tells them that she's in the other world just like Iris was, and they need to get her out. We pick up from an even lower res camera than we're used to, coming from Jess's toy camera. She tells her that when she grows up, she wants to fly away and be a bird. But when turning the question on Mel, she hesitates to answer, implying that her fate has yet to be sealed. Mel is still being being held at Rockport, and Steven comes in apologizing, saying this is the only way to keep them safe. He watched the tapes and recognized the man as the researcher, but going by Alex Davenport. She still doesn't want to be locked up. She explains about how he basically groomed Jess for years and they have to help her. He seems to relent to let her leave, but has someone to show her first, bringing her to Annabelle's room, still scribbling away on pictures of Iris. They appear to have gotten tricked, Steven locking them in the room, but again, he actually thinks he's helping them by forcing her to not be able to go back to the viscer. Mel can recognize Iris now, and when finding out about her, Annabelle starts frantically scratching out her face, again confirming that she's not dead, but in the other world and wants to come home tonight. She knows because Cassandra told her the Karen Comet is looming high in the sky. Mel tells her sorry for fucking things up, but will not give up on Jess. Dan asks again about his dad. Was he really trying to help? And he was, at least according to Mel. She also knows that she didn't die either. Mel, just like 
Iris wants to come home and needs Dan to find her. She mentions another survivor, Jess, who changed her name and is now a nun in Haiti. She left behind a bag of tapes before she left. They at first try to play them as audio cassettes, but Dan realizes it's not audio, but video used by that specific Pixel Vision camera. He luckily has one in his collection, and the footage picks up with a question to Mel, tentatively saying that she just wants to be happy. On another, we see it's Mel having found Jess's camera, then realizing that she must have gone back after all. She declares herself of sound mind and blames Sam for all of his various wrongdoings. If something happens, he's responsible. She uses a key to access the sixth floor and hears Jess in a locked apartment. She passes through the druggy lair and climbs out to the neighboring apartment. Jess insists that she doesn't want to go. They need her, but Mel shoots straight with her. Whatever they said was a lie, and they are going to kill her. She naively thinks that they wouldn't do that, Mel knowing that's exactly why they chose you. You're naive. As for her mom, she doesn't know, but according to the others, she'll be waiting for her. And I'm all, uh huh, yeah, they killed her already, right? She convinces Jess to get out of here and wait at the nearby police station just as Smith comes busting in, surprised to see her. Figuring out what she did, he gets violent and knocks her out. She comes to in the ritual room, Sam happy to see that she made her way home. They already know about Jess leaving, but it's okay. They have a new vessel already in Tamra. And it's time to get the party started. They clang on the tuning forks and everyone starts humming our favorite song. Sam starts reading from the book as everyone dons their masks. A guy drags her to the statue, Mel furiously trying to fight back. Sam cuts her palm, bleeding onto the statue, which fills in its various orifices. He calls forth Tamara, thanking her for being a vessel and stuff right before slitting her throat. A loud whooshing rushes in, accompanied by a blue glow, and the tunnel returns. Iris manifests inside to Sam's confusion, and Jess screams out for Mel watching from the stairs. She tells her to run, and Sam grabs her arm, the three sucked into the portal before it vanishes away. Jess's camera is a haze of cosmic energy as she flees, overtaken by white noise. After this, Mark does a very helpful recap of our major events. Iris does ritual, something went wrong, mansion collapses, everyone dies, flash forward to 94, and Sam tries the same thing, including Mel as the unwilling Baldung Witch, still resulting in the same disaster. According to them, they are getting a glimpse into Caligo's home world, and the door that they open is where the two dimensions intersect. Perhaps the visions and waking dreams are a way of her reaching out through this veil. Dan thinks that she must be trapped in the other world, and for some reason thinks that Virgil will help him execute his rescue plan. He of course has no interest in even talking to him, until Dan brings up they found another tape, and entices him that it features the end of his brother's story. He shows him a little bit, but before spilling all of his beans, Dan's got some burning questions for him. Starting with that he must have known what was on the tapes, right? He still says that it isn't true, only knowing that Mel was shooting footage of Sam and his cult. He knew that he was searching for the Voss snuff film in order to open a door, and even told Virgil all about his intention, but he thought he was crazy. He takes in the power of film, being able to capture moments for eternity that we were never meant to have, and wonders what else can we scoop up that can't be seen. A glimpse into another world, he considers. He only recently procured the tapes after popping up at an auction in Jersey last year, and it was Steven that put them there, probably due to their dangerous nature, trying to get him away from everybody. Either way, Virgil says this was a mistake, because this is what caused their house to get burned down. See, again, the dude's like the biggest liar on the planet. A couple episodes ago, he's like, maybe Mel set your house on fire, and now he's like, oh yeah, it's this other stuff. Virgil does reveal that there are two opposing forces at play. Those who will do anything to bring the demon into the world, and others who want to prevent this from happening, as we saw back in 24. His family paid the price, they were basically caught in the middle, and as for Dan's escape, it was entirely accidental. He brings up his belief that Mel is trapped in the other world, but thinks it's impossible, as humans can't survive there. No one can for any length of time. He reveals a bit more about his ambitions, that he spent 20 years trying to access these powers. Dan interjects that his brother is in there too, showing the rest of the footage with everyone vanishing. We can save them both, he gravely states. Virgil sniffs that his brother was an egomaniac and sees no reason to free him from the tomb that he trapped himself within. Dan loses it and attacks him, but Virgil ups the ante with a big old gun. He tells him that he did really like him, and about to shoot is felled by a surprise attack from Mark. Woo, good timing, dude. Dan knows they have everything here already they need to do the ritual, first taking some blood, and he appears confident that he knows what he's doing. There's also a lot of other important things to check out the list to make sure it works. And as for the room, Dan thinks they must have installed Karenite panels to replace the dying comet. Well, that way you could do the ritual all the time and wouldn't have to wait 70 years. Mark reminds him that things have ended twice so far in total failure, and there is no way he's going to 
let him slit his throat. But Dan clarifies that he's not trying to bring back Kalego, but merely to open a door. Just about to get started, they encounter another roadblock when Bobby appears also holding a gun on Mark. She accuses him of wanting to hijack this thing, and he tells her that he's just trying to help someone who is trapped. She wants to know why he's willing to risk his life for a stranger, but as always, he truly feels that he knows Mel by now. And the two did even manage to find each other across time and everything, so it's got, you know, it's kind of a bond. Bobby reveals that the others thought that they had everything, but they were wrong, producing a different tuning fork. And they put together that she must be a ball dunk. And even more revelatory is actually Julia, Mel's mom. She's been right under his nose the entire time. She thought that by giving her up as a kid that she'd be safe and wouldn't have to bear the burden of their bloodline, admitting that she had no idea they would come looking for her. She hasn't been so absent after all either, and has spent the last 25 years trying to bring her back. Mel seems to have been reaching out to Julia too, saying that she dreamed of her daughter every night. Similar to the stuff with Dan, I imagine. However, she doesn't have her magic anymore, so she needed Virgil to be able to make this possible. To make the veil thin enough to crack inside. Apparently, that's what playing the footage like Dan did causes, unraveling the spell that holds the door shut. Man, there are a lot of steps to keep track of with this thing. I'll tell you what. He was just going to come out of the TV earlier, and now it's like, no, 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 only, only the comet and the fucking blood and the guy and the bald dungs and then you know don't forget the ice cream after every world has its own frequency and you have to find the right one to be able to open the crack door dan mentions what virgil said about surviving there and she spits back he doesn't know what he's talking about there is still kaleo to tin with he will try to keep you there via trickery and she can only hold the tunnel open for five minutes instructing him to follow the fork sound to find his way back here the tunnel emerges and dan steps inside appearing back in the compound and seeing that the time on his watch starts to slow. Coming all the way to a full stop in between time, like I told you, and the telltale particles have reappeared. The metronome clicks and he appears back in his childhood home, his sister still there playing that dang song. Followed by Steven entering saying he likes that song. What is it? It looks like he's being presented with what he wants, his family back, his mom even calling him over for a nice family dinner. He of course has to ask about the fire and Steven says there was no fire, being assured that he's safe here, offering that they can have the life that he wants. Dan takes the moment in, and a small smile crosses his face, but flashes of melody remind him of his purpose, also knowing that this isn't real. He can't have them back. It does not work like that. This is clearly the kind of stuff Julia was warning about with regards to Kalego. He's trying to trick Dan into staying in this world. He steps out into a hallway that looks like the Vissers, and navigates his way through never-ending stretching corridors and mirrored room layouts. He hears the sound of a joy division song that Mel listened to, and passes through a curtain entering into the main chapel of St. Joseph's. He finds her nestled amongst the pews, and she appears surprised to see him. He is able to convince her to come along, after some initial hesitation of this being a trick. He grabs her hand, and the church bell tolls as the room starts to shake. The lights all explode, and they run from the area as it crumbles away right behind them. They are back to the never-ending hallway, and he doesn't get how they ended up here. They were supposed to be back at the compound. He sees the security cameras displayed on the TV, and flips through the channel seeing the mini cameras around the house. Mel is lured away by that chanting sound and hears it coming from the vent. Just like the beginning of this whole thing, she opens a little door and it instantly stops. Caligo himself appears in the mirror and she screams insanely, Dan dragging her back out into the halls. They find themselves in the mail area, listening intently for the fork sound to follow. Everything goes completely awry when out of nowhere Samuel appears and yanks Mel away, dragging her into a portal. It dissipates, leaving Dan Dan alone in the hall, at least Mel finally makes it back to our world. Her long search for mom is there to lend a hand, although Mel doesn't recognize her after, you know, 25 years. As for Dan, she says she doesn't know what happened. He was right next to her. And then Samuel was there too, she stammers. Dan rouses in a strange hospital, confused once more. A nurse explains that he was the only survivor of the fire at Visser and has been out for a few days. And yep, as he sees on the TV, he has been shot back to 1994. Made even more abundantly clear when he notices the reflections of the twin towers in the distance. Oh boy. Okay, whoo! I get how that ending feels very confusing and leaves us with a pile of questions. Let's start with what we know for sure happened. Mel was transported to present day, while Dan somehow was sent back to 1994. But how it happened is odd, since Samuel appears and grabs her into the tunnel, yet he doesn't show up in the present with Mel. We also don't see Iris at all either. The only reason his actions make sense is if this is what 
Samuel wanted to happen. As though there is another unknown plan that we're seeing in action here. And I did think it's interesting that earlier he told Mel she would be reunited with her mom. And, well, look what happened. He did live up to at least one of his promises after all. Although we have no idea of his motivation, it does seem at least a big intent was to separate Mel and Dan once more across time. They don't want them to be together. Again, not sure why, but their connection is obviously very strong, especially at this point. All of this made me really start realizing how little we actually do know about a ton of things in the show's world. Over the course of the season, we learn all about the Voss cult and their whole deal, along with solving the mystery of Mel and what happened to her at the Visser. It's also important to point out the parallel personal journeys that Mel and Dan go through. Each are kind of trying to find themselves as well as deal with lingering familial issues. By the end, they both have come to terms with these holes in their past. Mel reunites with her mom, finds out her lineage as a ball dung, and Dan learns that his dad was indeed a good person just trying to help. But he also has to learn in the other world to finally let go of his family. They can't come back despite what Iris and the others are trying to do that flies in the face of this concept. Again, not natural like her brother said. These character arcs are completed and main mysteries are solved, but it honestly feels like there's even more unknown than known at this point, all kind of emanating from the outer edges of what has been developed. That was my big takeaway from the ending. We don't know exactly how that went down because we simply don't have enough information. We're just scratching the surface of this world. As just one example that kept kind of rolling around in my head who built the Visser in the first place. Obviously the Voss family built their mansion, but after the failed ritual, presumably they're all gone, at least their leader is. So who with ties to the cult was still alive and built the apartment building? It implies that there's a whole other group out there beyond what we've seen that has been keeping the Voss society's ideals alive. Maybe her brother that bailed that night had a change of heart about what his sister was doing or something like that. And of course, somebody had to burn Dan's family's house down. So somebody's out there, regardless someone that knew about the cult had to have built the Visser, knowing of its power, and of course, including the symbol on the exterior. But who? Again, just one little underdeveloped aspect that unravels a much bigger mystery with huge potential implications. Probably the biggest questions surround the enigmatic Virgil. I mean, this guy is so full of beans, you never know if he's telling you the whole truth at any point. I mean, he pretends that he doesn't know anything about what's going on, but by the end says he's been trying to harness the power here for two decades, quite a shift you know? He also must have been the one who raided the remains of the Visser and collected all the various artifacts needed for the ritual like the statue and the witchcraft book. Then of course he must also be the one who recreated the Voss ritual room under the facility. No one else could have been behind it. Even as Dan points out, the walls in the new room are made of Karenite to stand in place for the Karen Comet. Remember one of the things Mark mentioned LMG was into? Yep, synthetic gemstone manufacturing. And the blood fridge was already there when Thomas was at the facility prior to Dan, and so Virgil had to have known about the ritual specifics and was trying to recreate it for some time. Again, this means he's been aware of the real deal about the cult and Caligo and everything. We don't know the full depth of what he knows because, well, he's lying all the time. This is why I wouldn't be surprised to find out that Virgil has actually been working with his brother despite him writing him off previously. It leads me to believe that the outcome in the end is exactly what Virgil and potentially Sam have been planning for from the beginning. Everything had to happen the way that we saw, because it's only now that they are able to successfully complete the ritual, thanks to Julia's special ball dung tuning fork. You wouldn't have known about this without her also getting involved. So again, he got exactly what he wanted, to finally successfully traverse through the veil between our worlds, all with that same goal of somehow harnessing that power for his own means. Julia also casually mentions that each world has its own frequency that must be specifically tuned into. This opens up the possibility of traveling to any time or place, not just to the other world, something we haven't seen explored in any capacity at this point. Although there is the strange moment where Virgil shows up in 1994 with his brother, but he looks like he does in the present. He should appear 25 years younger, you know? This sent me down another rabbit hole, as maybe Virgil is actually traveling back to the past to work with his brother, sometime after what we've seen so far, and they figure 
figure out how to do the time traveling thing correctly. There's another even wackier possibility, as amongst Sam's fake identities was Virgil Samuelson. Seems odd that he would use his brother's name, which led me to consider that maybe Virgil and Sam are actually the same person, Sam being his younger self. There's no real evidence beyond that one little clue to back any of this up, but that would be quite a surprising development. As at some point, Virgil had to have founded the massive LMG company and develop it to where it is now, and it makes sense in a way that they took advantage of time itself to be able to grow into the mega company we see in present day. Kinda like Biff in Back to the Future 2 or something. Yeah, it is a lot. There's perhaps less mystery as to what comes next for our leading dynamic duo, as things end up a kind of flip from the original setup, with Mal now having to find a way to help her pal trapped in the past. But things are quite different than how they started, with Mel and Dan already able to communicate directly in the dream particle realm. That should make it a lot easier to help him out. And I also imagine that Julia will train her daughter further to hone her Baldung powers. And who knows what that will make her capable of? I mean, it's magic for goodness sakes. As for Dan, while he is definitely stuck for now in 94, there is one big potential thanks to his displacement. Can he actually prevent the fire that took out his family? We don't know the timeline of when the Visser burned down and then when his house did, but the possibility is certainly intriguing. Would he be able to prevent the fire and unleash a ripple effect through the timeline? Now, I'm not sure how the show actually treats time travel at this point. Can the past change things, or is this how it was always meant to be? That whole competing concept. And saving his fam might undermine Dan's difficult decision to let them go after years of suffering from that trauma. Anyway, wow! So yeah, there is a lot to still develop in season two and beyond. I'm honestly kind of surprised that the show hasn't been officially renewed at this point, considering it topped the charts on Netflix since its debut. Hopefully that official announcement will come soon, and we can see how the world and story will continue to develop. That brings us to the conclusion of this extremely in-depth explain video on Archive 81. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Archive 81 and its ending? Where do you see things going in Season 2? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time. I'm going to go drink about three gallons of water.